Good morning and welcome to Coffee with Rich. If you're joining me live this morning on Facebook, thank you so much for being on Coffee with Rich on this Friday morning, January the 29th. If you're joining me in a podcast later on, glad to have you as well. Today we're joined by Mr. John Hearn. Very excited to have John on the show. He was a podcast guest on Mike and I's show, American Warrior Show, sometime and um, I'm really excited to have him on. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rich Brown. I am the co-host and co-founder of the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show. I'm a retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, corrections officer, et cetera. If you want to, if you want to read my bio, if you're into that, please check out AmericanWarriorSociety.com. I really want to thank our sponsors before we get too far into the show this morning. We have some amazing sponsors, and I would encourage you to check out AmericanWarriorShow.com. Where all of our sponsors are listed as where as well as discount codes for everybody that watches and listens to Coffee with Rich, as well as the American Warrior Show. Our sponsors are Century Martial Arts, makers of the Bob XL. If you have a striking routine, you really need to get yourself a Bob XL. And I really recommend the Bob XL because it has a little bit longer torso and lower appendages so that you can work on those leg strikes. APP Hemp. You want to work on your cognitive ability, et cetera, please check out APPHemp.com. My good friend, Jesse Ross, we're in the Marines together, makers of some of the finest CBD products, including salves, rollies, et cetera. Check out APPHemp.com and use our discount code. You can find that on our website. Cool Fire Trainer right now, ammunition, if you can find it, is incredibly expensive. Get yourself a Cool Fire Trainer and really up your dry fire game. Mountain Man Medical, if you're looking for some of the finest TCCC compliant kits out there, please check out a Mountain Man Medical. And finally, PrecisionHolsters.com. <clears throat> I've got a match tomorrow. It's going to be freezing cold. Not looking forward to that, but I'll be using my Precision uh, Holsters equipment. So again, John, thank you for coming on to the show, and thank you for the 20 folks that are already watching us live. Please hit that like and share button before we get on with John because you definitely want to do that. So let's take a quick pause here, hit the like and share button so that everybody gets this information because John is going to be sharing with us some of the latest uh, information on criminology, trends, crime trends, where is this all going, recidivism rates. It's going to blow your hair back, I promise you, because I've already watched his video presentation. It was incredibly impressed. We have uh, Mike is on, Mike Varley. Good morning. PJ Tahoe out there. It's probably a snowy day where you are, sir. Dallas is on, Jeffrey is on, Betty is on, Linda, Rat, Rasmic, Georgia, uh, Ernie, Robert. Wow, thank you to all the 20 folks. Please like and share. And without further ado, Mr. Hearn, good morning, sir. Hey, hey, Rich, how are you doing? I'm doing better than I deserve, my friend. Hey, I, but let's go ahead and get it on the open, man. Uh, I really loved your presentation the other day that you gave. The video lecture that you gave was absolutely incredible. We're going to talk a lot about that. I think the title of the of this presentation was How Paranoid Are You? Crime, Criminals, and Victimization. It was outstanding. I encourage everyone out there watching this morning to check it out. So, John, that really kind of sparked my need to really get you on the show, sir. Well, well, thanks for that. I appreciate that. I have to give credit where credit is due. That was solely the uh, the doing of Tiffany Johnson. She demanded that I do that presentation and she held my hand with all the tech. So, you know, as good as that presentation was, um, she's what made it really look good. So she definitely deserves uh, some kudos for that. And I think <clears throat> those of us that were in law enforcement in the late 80s or well, I, I was a cop in the mid 90s. Uh, you know, we think that, well, things have gotten so much better today and uh, we're so much better off. But then you kind of look at the data and scratch your head and like, well, there's a couple of reasons why we're a little bit better off. And I want to talk to some of those today. But before I do, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, John? OK, so uh, real quickly here, um, the main reason I guess I'm somewhat authoritative to talk about this is I actually do have a, a master's degree in criminal justice uh, at the uh, risk of insulting some folks. I call it a real master's degree. It was from Virginia Commonwealth University back in 1996. Uh, it was a um, Ph.D. track uh, program. So I had to write a thesis. I have an academic publication under my belt. So I had a, and the actual concentration I had was in research methods. Uh, Besides that, I've done a lot of other research, writing, speaking. Uh, I did a chapter from Masada Yeeb's book, Armed Self-Defense, What the Experts Want You to Know. I've been speaking uh, on that training circuit, for lack of a better word, since about 2005. Everything from the, the NTI, ILFE, ISOA, uh, Rangemaster, TACCON, that sort of thing. 
I've also been a practitioner in the criminal justice world. I've been a law enforcement officer since 1992. Uh, started out as a dispatcher with the local sheriff's office before that. Uh, I've done a lot of court interaction over the years. Uh, I was actually uh, worked in the Eastern District of California as a as an agency prosecutor. I've been our court liaison. I've you know testified in federal district court on homicide trials, that sort of thing. So I've had a pretty good uh, dunking in that legal system. Uh, personality wise, I think it's really important. Uh, most of us are familiar with stuff like the Myers Brig, you know, introvert, extrovert, that kind of thing. There's another one out there that's actually useful called the DISC. And when I took the DISC, it was like somebody was reading my mail. It said I was a very high C, and that's people that just enjoy knowledge for knowledge's sake. So I can go to the local university library, sit down, and much like you used to web surf before everybody just watched cat videos on YouTube, I'll just sit there and go from journal article to journal article and just kind of delve in there really deeply. Uh, finally, I have to give credit where credit is due. Part of the reason I, I think I do this fairly well is I just hung out with a lot of smart people over the years. Uh, I was going out to the Range Master Tactical Conference. Uh, I was going to present my Miami presentation for the first time, and I didn't really understand the bad guys yet. Well, sitting in the car next to me was William April, a uh, great guy that understood criminals better than just about anybody else in this field. And I literally had a 10 hour trip where we sat down and we broke down those guys. So, um, you know, spending time with people smarter than me is has definitely helped as well. Not that that's necessarily a high bar, but I've done it. Oh, I appreciate it, John. Yeah. Uh, I'm with you, brother. Uh, I could, we talked about books before we got going this morning. I'm one of those people like you, I could go to a library and my wife's going to have to come get me in about six weeks. I'm just going to lose myself in there. And I don't know why that is. I need to pull my, I've taken the disc before. And I remember one of those yellow bars being through the roof. And I, I, I that might be the same as yours. 31 folks on this morning, John. Hey, please like and share. We got Jeremiah is on. John is on. Gerald out there in Oregon. James Vick. Good morning. Robert Gayhart. Troy is up there. Coin number 848. If you want to know what a coin number is, please check out AmericanWearSociety.com and find out if becoming a coin member of our self-defense society is the right thing for you. Uh, Robert Gayhart says, good morning, Warrior Community. Coin number 1401 from Northern Kentucky. Jarrah is on. Jerry is on. Good morning, all. 30, 32 folks joining. Cool. Everybody's in here to see you this morning, John, on a Friday I, morning. I appreciate it. I'll say, I think I'm coin 1123 for what it's worth. It's above my head. I'd have to step off camera to get you the number, but uh, y'all do good work. Well, thank you, John. And I tell you, I, uh, I've embarrassed myself one time. We were teaching uh, Seattle PD a few years back, and I the, they were supposed to meet us at the airport and take us to the range. And the, the Seattle police officers were waiting there. They all had their coin numbers out. And, of course, I didn't have my coin on me, and I was embarrassed and had to do push-ups and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, good times. Let's get into the questions this morning because I, I really thought long and hard about what I wanted to talk to you about. One of the things that you said, I believe in your lecture, John, or I've heard you say other other places, something to the effect that you're a criminology research nerd or something like that. Am I, am I on target with that? Uh, I'm a shameless nerd. I, I admit it. Like I said, that's just kind of the way I'm wired. Yeah. And uh, it, was there an impetus for that? I mean, what, what led you down that path? Uh, I think, again, a natural disposition to that. Um, I think one of the, the great viewers is my mom uh, out there. She'll tell you since I was a kid, you know, we were we were readers. So, you know, we were literally the kids showing up at the bookmobile, getting all the awards for the summer. <clears> so <throat> I just kind of transferred that reading to whatever subject interests me. What I'll typically do is I'll find something that sparks my interest and I just dig into it and dig into it till it exhausts me. You know, I've got a couple of areas that I have some fairly specialized knowledge in, uh, but it's, you know, kind of, I think, you know, you, you said better than you deserve earlier. That's a Dave Ramsey quote. And one of the Dave's things says, you, just, you go out and read every book in a field and pretty soon you're an expert. So I don't know if I'm an expert in all the fields I like to talk about, but I certainly have a pretty good depth of knowledge. And it's just a matter of digging into the material. I mean, we write things down. That's where knowledge is, is in books. Um, and you just dig into it so you think you've exhausted and you understand the subject. So I would say there was uh, some natural wiring in that direction. And then just a matter of where my interests have run. Yeah, I, I've mentioned it elsewhere or to other people. I don't know if I've ever talked about it on the show. There's a great book by Mortimer J. Adler called uh, How to Read a Book. I think he was a professor at Columbia University way back in the day, maybe in the 40s. And one of the things that he said is, if you consider the fact that when you read a book, you're reading everything that expert knows cover to cover. So let's take a guy who's a PhD in animal husbandry. And over the course of his natural life, he's written everything he knows in the space of like this. 
And if you want to really get good at a topic, you find out who the top three folks are in, let's say, animal husbandry, the top three folks, and you read their books cover to cover and, and triangulate the information. And you have a pretty well, well-rounded uh, sense of the subject by the time you're done with that. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. And when you combine that with some life experience, I think that there's, uh, you know, you were a, a practitioner in the criminal justice system, uh, you know, people that work probation and parole, people that have been around criminals um, have a completely different take on this subject. It's kind of like, you know, ER nurses, uh, cops and ER nurses get along really well, um, you know, up until they get divorced, I guess, uh, <laughs> because they deal with the same people. They see the same, you know, for lack of a better word, trash in, in their respective jobs. And they know what the uh, that lower level of society looks like. Yeah, well said. <clears throat> and I, I was a corrections officer before I went on the road. And I, I've always said if I could wave a wand and, and make that uh, a prerequisite to do at least a year in corrections before you go out on the street, because you get you get to surround yourself with them day in and day out and actually interact with them. Uh, I, I thought it was really beneficial. Would you agree or disagree? Absolutely. And again, it's just understanding what you're dealing with, because everybody has all these great theories. Uh, there's, you know, whole universities full of people that swear to know better than the people that actually do this stuff. Um, but there's something to be said for experience. And the other thing is, I think some some road officers or patrol officers that go straight to the road, they kind of look down their nose at corrections. And I think that's the wrong, wrong way to do it, because uh, I got nothing but the highest respect for our brothers and sisters that are working the yard every single day, man, that's a tough it job. It takes a special person to be going and get there and locked in that with yourself. You know, when I take somebody to jail and drop them off, it's a quick little visit for me. That's not my workplace. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm glad I'm out of it. Uh, thank you to everyone joining this morning and everyone listening in, in the podcast. We appreciate it. Uh, next question I got for you, John, is I recently, like I said at the beginning, I recently attended your video presentation. How paranoid are you? crime, criminals, and victimization. It was outstanding, like I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, tell us about some of the alarming stats that, that, and that stand out to you. I mean, it was several hours long, really detailed, lots of dense information, but you gave it to us in a very palatable form, like uh, almost just the facts, but also let me uh, ruminate and tell you why this is an important stat. What are some of the things that stick out to you? Well, you know, there's just, I think the biggest thing is that everybody, the, the, larger society and the media as a whole tends to lie to us about where violent crime is. Everybody just talks about how good it is compared to its worst point. And, you know, that worst point was around 1991, 1993, which is, again, part of the reason that massive federal crime bill that we hear, we've heard so much about in this recent election happened. Violent crime was really, really bad. And everybody talks about um, how much better it is now and how everything continues to trend down. Well, that that's factually true, but they don't talk about that period of time before it was at its worst and outside of homicide, which um, is low because we have such great medical technology, all the other major categories of violent crime are still much, much higher than their historical, you know, what we could call like a typical, like around 1960, what the actual homicide rate was. So, you know, or, you know, what the violent crime rate was. So, you know, there's things like, you know, ag aggravated assault is, I think it's like two and a half times the rate that it was, in 1960. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, they're blowing a lot of smoke when they tell you about how great things are. Well, and I think one of the things, if I remember correctly, that you brought out about that aggravated assault is that a lot of uh, district attorneys are labeling things aggravated assault that before we would be, uh, you know, attempted murder. Am I correct well, on that? Yeah, aggravated assault is a very interesting category. Um, aggravated assault is like the, the criminal runners up category. You know, a lot of <laughs> aggravated assaults are people that tried to murder somebody, but were unsuccessful. And the unsuccessful could be their ineptitude, right? You know, if you don't actually have the bullets in the magazine all in the right direction, that can, you know, limit your ability to commit homicide. But the other thing we, we keep forgetting is that we've had the, uh, you know, every time we have a war, whether it's Vietnam or the Great War on Terror, um, medical technology improves tremendously. So whenever, you know, we, we're talking about how good everything's are, this is with massive amount of saves going on. People that years ago would have been straight up homicides, they would be dead. Um, emergency rooms, especially trauma centers in major cities, work miracles. You know, the last time I heard, uh, we're really close to the Memphis area. I'm pretty familiar with that. You know, uh, if you if you admit ten people into there with gunshot wounds, they'll all make it. You know, you actually have to admit that eleventh person to even have a chance of showing up. And pretty much, if you can get them to the hospital with a pulse, they're going to make it out of there. Now, the problem with aggravated assault is you're still alive, 
but you've probably had a dramatic curtailing in the quality of life. Um, I don't know the figures off the top of my head, but you know, every time somebody cracks open your chest in surgery, um, it takes years off of your life. You know, an aggravated assault can mean that you have to use a colostomy bag for the rest of your life. It could be that you're crippled in one arm. Maybe you've lost vision in an eye. Maybe you limp. So people are like, well, homicide's down really low. Well, it is. Uh, it's back to pretty much almost identical to the level it was in 60. But the aggravated assault rate is 229 percent higher than it was in 1960. And those are events that have huge catastrophic effects on people. So that um, bump in aggravated assault shows that violent crime is still happening a lot. Um, we're just better at preventing those uh, assaults from turning into deaths. They just tend to be, end up being grievous bodily injuries. So you mentioned aggravated assault and how it's up. How much was the percentage it's up? 250? Uh, yeah, 229% <laughs> from uh, the 19, uh, 19, I think it's 1960 or 1961, uh, that rate. Um, you know, okay. uh, yeah, I managed to flip through here. I'm, I'm sorry, I misspoke actually. I'm sorry, that was rape. Aggravated assault is up 188%, murders up 4%, rapes up 229%, and robberies up 48% from that, uh, from that uh, historic average of, you know, around 1960, 1961. Again, much better than it was in 1991, but that's still a lot of violent crime that's ongoing. It is a lot of violent crime, and we're going to talk to in just a moment, folks, uh, why the crime has come down since 1991. It's, it's probably different than what you think. But I would also let, let's talk about aggravated assault. Let's stay on that for just a second, because I, I like the way you phrase that. It's kind of like a runner's up. Um, what's the clearance rate for violent crime? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, for aggravated assault. And I believe from the presentation it was around 50, 52 percent clearance rate for aggravated assault last year. Can you talk to that, John? Yeah, I, uh, I'm kind of um, do the search real quick here, but I, I think that uh, you're optimistic. The only thing that we clear, um, oh, actually, um, yeah, it's right at 52%. So overall violent crime clearance rate in the country is 45%. You know, we clear murder at, at typically at about 61%. But again, that sounds okay until you realize that almost 40% of homicides in this country go unsolved. And again, there's some geographic areas of the country where that's actually much, much higher. Aggravated assaults are cleared at about you know 52.3 percent, but only a third of rapes are cleared, and about 30 percent of robberies are cleared. And that definition of clearance is also you know that they use for statistical purposes is also very broad. You know, everybody thinks that a crime was cleared. Well, somebody was they investigated, they arrested him, he charged him, and that that person was sent to prison. That's not how the stats count clearances. Clearances could be that we identified a suspect, but the district attorney declined to charge him. It could be that we swore out a warrant and another agency extradited him. When they say that there's a clearance rate, it means that they were basically able to identify the offender, but nothing says that person was actually rendered to the criminal justice system for further prosecution. So that, you know, that murder rate of 60% or murder clearance rate of 60%, that sounds good, doesn't mean that 60% of the people that commit murders in this country actually physically go to prison. They just were able to identify the suspect. Yeah, so that that should be a staggering statistic for you folks this morning. I mean, when you consider, you know, a taking of a human life and we're, we're clearing them at, at such low rates. I mean, and I, and I know our law enforcement out there, they're doing everything in their power to, to get convictions. But sometimes it just isn't it isn't possible. Kevin is on this morning. Dan is on uh, out coin number 1968. Kevin Park is on coin number 1334. Uh, Orinda. David Garrett, good morning, sir. Gerald is on. Good morning. Hey, uh, th th this this stuff right here is incredibly important. Please share this because what I like about it is let's cut through the, the feelings you have about crime and let's really get down to some of the trends. And one of the trends that I want to talk about next, recidivism, is something that really was highlighted recently. Uh, Mike and I were teaching a class out west and there was a really big guy and when everybody went around and you know, tell us about yourself, where you're from. And he said he was a federal probation officer. So on one of the breaks, I went up to the guy and said, you know, uh, what are you seeing in terms of recidivism? And he says, I'm not, I'm not seeing much of anything. And I said, oh, okay, cool. You know, I guess you don't want to chit chat. So I walk away. He's like, oh, Rich, sorry. One, one thing. I manage multiple states. I, that's not true. He goes in the uh, Republican controlled states. I see low recidivism rates because they're locked up longer in the Democratic controlled states. I see more recidivism rate rates because they're locked up for less time. So it's a matter of incarceration, giving them uh, giving them an opportunity or not to commit or recommit crime. What what does the data say about recidivism? 
Uh, the data says that we have a, uh, you know, a small group of hardcore offenders that continue to commit criminal acts. And um, everybody wants to think that America is special or unique. But when you look at the literature, this holds true across multiple, you know, all of the Western nations, for lack of a better word. You know, depending on where you count, you know, there's five to 10 percent of the population, uh, criminal population that commits the majority of the crime, you know, you know, 60, sometimes as much as 60 percent. Interestingly enough, you know, a couple of things that I've picked up since the talk is number one, uh, the most um, effective predictor of that is just how soon they started committing acts. The sooner somebody starts out as a criminal, the longer they're going to be a criminal and the more violent and more crimes they're going to commit over their span of life. Interesting enough, one of the biggest flags are people that commit vi uh, commit violent acts while in prison. You know, we think about murder and, and rape in prison, but that's actually not the, ma the majority of inmates aren't doing that. It's a small, hardcore offenders. They're basically um, they're snakes. They're going to be a snake when they come in. They're going to be a snake when they leave. It's who they are for a variety of reasons. Um, so, yeah, we definitely have recidivism problems to the point that, you know, California has effectively dumbed down their criminal justice system. They took a lot of things that used to be felonies. They aren't anymore. Uh, you know, you now have to steal over a thousand dollars of um, merchandise from a store to be counted as a, a chargeable crime. So you literally have people coming in and stealing nine hundred ninety dollars worth of stuff, walking out and not getting charged. So you know, the system is doing its best to hide that recidivism rate. But again, you know, you have a small percentage of people doing the vast majority of, of criminal acts. I mean, you have to work really hard to get into prison in the United States. Uh, a lot of most excuse me, most jurisdictions have a first time offender program where even if you commit something like a felony, you will probably get that thing deferred. You know, you'll you go sit out. Um, you know, if you promise not to get in any more trouble, uh, this will go away. So people that end up in prison have gone through, a, have had to work really, really hard to get there. Um, some of the, the research suggests that, you know, um, you take the population as a whole, maybe about a third of them have gotten arrested at some point in their life. But when you look at the group that's um, been arrested two times, that drops into like the teens as far as a percentage of the population. And the people that have gotten, been arrested more than three times, but again, this is just arrest. This isn't... Uh, you know, conviction, anything like that. Uh, by the time you get down to the third arrest, you're talking into single digits. So there's definitely a huge funnel that kind of gets there. So, you know, these guys that are, you know, coming out of prison, you know, uh, some of the data suggests uh, one of the, the things that I found interesting was that people, being, when they interviewed people being released from prison, uh, they had like an average of 10 arrests and five previous convictions for the charges. So again, we're seeing a very, very small percentage of people committing a vast variety of the mayhem, which is, again, that was the uh, the impetus for the third strike laws. There's some really good research out there that shows um, what a problem these hardcore offenders are. And the three strikes law was an attempt to deal with that. It's like, you know, it's very obvious that the third time you're through the system, um, you know, you're probably this is probably who you are. You know, the, one of the, the, the classic things nobody wants to admit is that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So if you've been out there robbing and raping and murdering, Guess what you're probably prone to do, you know, the exact to keep doing the exact same thing. No, I totally agree with you. And Elke is warning us about speciesism. Uh, <laughs> hey, morning, Elke. He says, you know, we're calling snakes that we can get in trouble with the woke culture these days uh, talking about snakes. But anyway, one of the things that uh, in your presentation, you quote Heather McDonald, uh, attorney, author, criminologist, she said, quote, prison remains a lifetime achievement award for persistence and criminal offending. And I thought, wow, that is so true. You're really going to have to work hard to put yourself in prison. And like you said, three strike laws, the crime bill in 1994, we probably want to talk about that, how that uh, increased, because you hear a lot of stuff, John, about, oh my God, in America, we lock up more citizens than, than any other country. You know, we've got too many laws and, and really see John, see the, the deal is that I know this because I, I feel this. So uh, you'll just have to take my word on it. But most people in prison, I'd say like 99% are nonviolent drug offenders. Is that true? Is that what the data says? Uh, absolutely. It does not. Um, mm -hmm. That's just simply not the case. And, and that gets complicated. So if you give me a few minutes, I'll, I'll try to break this down. So first off, the vast majority of prisoners in this country are in state prisons, right? The federal system is different, okay? The federal system tends to incarcerate a different population, but you have to remember that the federal prisons are only housing, uh, you know, I think it's like 6% of the prisoners in custody. So the vast majority of people are in state prisons. When we look at the people in state prisons, 
only about 16% of those are there for drug related sentences. And again, you have to think about what it takes to get convicted. Nobody goes to prison for what they actually did. Okay. There's going to be, they got there via a plea bargain, which means if they had, I don't know, three counts of possession with intent to distribute, maybe they plead guilty to one possession with an intent to distribute, or maybe they had a single charge of possession with intent to distribute, uh, caught straight up selling. Um, but they plead to a possession for a, 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 a reduced sentence. So it avoids the possession with intent and, oh my God, they're just there for possession of drugs. Well, yeah, that's what they were ultimately incarcerated for, but that was not the underlying set of facts that got them there. You have to remember that violence is associated with the drug trade. Um, you know, so when you say these nonviolent drug offenders, well, the odds are if they're selling drugs, they are immersed in a business that deals in violence all the time. Um, you know, uh, you see a lot of times uh, when when we're talking about these people, the they're killing and beating people over territory in which to sell the drugs. So, yeah, I might you know have been convicted for selling drugs, but maybe I committed three aggravated assaults right in a drive by to protect my drug territory. Um, the other thing that we see while we're talking about this real quick, I just want to point out is that getting somebody convicted for a homicide is extremely difficult. You have to have cooperating witnesses. And in a lot of these high crime neighborhoods, there are no cooperating witnesses, which is part of the problem. So what ends up happening is the police know that dude, you know, some dude over here, they know who some dude is. Um, he's doing homicides. He's done a couple of aggravated assaults, right? And he's selling drugs. Well, cooperating witnesses for the homicides and aggravated assaults are very hard to come by, but they know they can catch him for the drugs. So he ends up going to prison, maybe for a possession, maybe for a very simple possession with intent to distribute. But that was because he was a really, really bad dude. And that's all they could pin him on. Um, you know, we were talking about books. There's a fascinating book called Get Inside. Uh, it was written by an L.A. Times um, reporter. Uh, you could tell that the author, when she started, didn't uh, didn't really like the police. But after, you know, three years of being immersed in that environment, her perspective kind of changed. And she talked about how a lot of times, you know, they can't get homicide charges so all they can get on the drug charges. So as we do start to think about eliminating the drug charges, that just makes those neighborhoods worse. The other thing to remember, though, is we're talking about somebody's history. So when they talk about nonviolent drug offenders, yeah, maybe what they went to prison for was a simple possession or possession with intent to distribute. But let's think about how that would happen, right? Uh, you've got, you know, another some dude, um, he uh, beats the holy crap out of his wife, right? Um, very violent, domestic, aggravated assault, maybe breaks the orbit of her eye, something like that. Uh, neighbors call the police, the police show up, uh, they hook him up, charge him for the aggravated assault. Um, maybe he's got a firearm on him and he's a prior convicted felon, right? So they throw the uh, felon with the firearm on him and he had a, a, in his pocket, he had a little beignet, a little baggie of meth. Well, let's think about, you know, what we can get this guy for. You know, the felon with the firearm, that's a really good thing to negotiate away. Um, the aggravated assault, they have to have the cooperating wife, uh, cooperating witness of the wife. Is she going to cooperate? Probably not. So when it comes time to actually, you know, plea bargain his case out, what can they easily show? OK, they've got the drug charges. Right. So, yeah. Did he go to drug? Uh, did he go to prison for simple possession of methamphetamine? Yeah. But the underlying facts are a lot broader as far as what he actually went to prison for. You know, the other thing is he may have gotten hooked up, you know, for selling dope, right? But he's been arrested and served time on two other occasions for violent crimes. I got news for you. That's not a nonviolent drug offender. You know, this particular time he got caught for a drug offense, but he is in fact a violent offender. Because again, that past behavior is the best predictor of, of future violence. So when you break it down really, really hard, number one, of the people in state prisons, only 16 there are there, 16% are there for drug related offenses. Of that 16%, only about 5 to 6%, so that's less than 1% of the entire population, are there for what we think of as low-level drug charges and no history of violence. Uh, you mentioned this earlier. Um, we, we can argue about what the purpose of the prison system is, uh, whether it's rehabilitation. Um, what we in America have largely settled on is an incapacitation model. It's like we don't have the ability to make you into a decent person. Uh, we've tried there's very few programs that have worked. Uh, Dr. Samanow's work points to some of the ways we might be able to do that, but he's not very popular. So we have almost largely settled on an incapacitation model, which is we're going to take you out of polite, decent society until you can figure out how to act properly. Uh, one of the things that is true about crime 
is that a lot of like that lower tier offenders tend to kind of age out. Um, and one of the theories is, is that they're, you know, they're effectively sociopaths, um, but they're not naturally wired that way. So, you know, as you get older, uh, you, you have less mental energy to, to construct the mental models you need to allow yourself to harm others. So a lot of those guys will age out. But, we, you know, we just tend to set people in prison away from the decent folks until they can behave. And, you know, we, we keep them in there for a number of years, let them out, see if they've learned their lesson. If they end up right back there, which a lot of them do, then you go you know another 10 years and see if you can uh, be a decent person when you get out. So that incapacitation is largely the model we've settled on. And quite frankly, you know, um, it leads to a lot of people in prison, but it leads to a lot of violent people in prison. The vast majority of people in American prisons are there for violent crimes. That's just the nature of the beast. Uh, and these are people, you know, serving longer sentences for homicides because the United States does tend to have longer sentences for homicides. Um, I think that's a good thing uh, from a variety of perspectives. Um, I think one of the most frustrating things as a criminal justice uh, practitioner is the system does not take care account of the victims at all. So um, the uh, it, it's immensely frustrating when somebody, you know, the idea of somebody doing a homicide and serving an eight year sentence for that, which is which is very common in European countries. Well, I mean, I guess that's great for him and we save some money incarcerating the people. But what about those family members, you know, that have that loved one that's gone that are, are dealing with that loss? So, you know, there's a lot of frustration. I think you, I'm sure you saw it. You know, the system could, you know, give two cups of warm hamster vomit for the majority of these victims of violent crimes. They just want to, you know, take care of the other victim, you know, which is the, uh, the violent offender. Sorry, that was a pretty good rant. <laughs> now it was a great rant. <clears throat> and you see this with, uh, you know, we, uh, we almost have a bizarre celebrity esque fascination with killers like, uh, the night stalker show that's currently, you know, one of the most popular shows on TV right now on Netflix. And it, it, I mean, it shows the the horrors that Richard Ramirez caused out there in California. But at the same time, it, it almost in a macabre way glorifies that level of violence. One of the things that you, I, I want to skip back to a couple of things you said, John. I wish I had the ability to put a put an image up here because a, a picture is worth a thousand words. I took a screenshot while I was watching your presentation, and one of the uh, images that you have, John, is it's showing big uniform crime statistic trends going up. And then as they start going down, you see the incarceration level go this way. And those lines intersect uh, on or about 2000. And I thought, wow, you know, that really, to me, makes a lot of sense as to why these things, we start giving away longer prison sentences. Like you said, John, the three strikes you're out laws and things like that, I think are probably a, a pretty good model at, uh, for that, but I also want to talk to something that you mentioned some time ago, and I'm, I apologize for circling back, but I'm looking at my notes here. You mentioned that uh, because of the advances in medicine, we really don't see the levels of homicide that we probably did or would have saw, let's say, in the 1960s. And I want to quote here from your presentation. This is coming from the Journal of Homicide Studies, quote, Without this technology, meaning life-saving technologies that we have now, without this technology, we estimate that there would be no less than 50,000 and as many as 115,000 homicides annually instead of the actual 15,000 to 20,000. And, um, and again, so you look at, wow, the homicide rate is down. Well, the homicide rate is down for a plethora of, of reasons, and it's not necessarily the ones that you would think, right? And it's absolutely, you know, the, the violence is still being done is the outcome of that violence that has changed. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's see here. Les says, great stuff. As usual, guys, the more educated we all become on this racket, the better off we will be. Thanks for the information. Kathleen says, Rich, maybe off topic, but what can we citizens do to help change these laws so that we can actually penalize criminals, especially repeat felons? Uh, personal distaste for local federal prosecution laws, having been on the victim end. I want punishment for these subhumans. What do you have for Kathleen? Uh, we, we've got to speak up. Um, I, I'm going to steer away from some of the blatantly political stuff right now, since uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still employed by the uh, <laughs> by part of that system. Um, you know, I think contacting senators, representatives still matters. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to go through a period now where criminal justice reform is being seriously considered. Um, and just, you know, I think it helps to remind people of why we have some of this stuff in place. You know, 
Um, they didn't, you know, everybody complains about mandatory minimums and sentencing guidelines uh, that were part of the 1994 crime bill. They didn't exist for nothing. They just didn't decide that was a good thing to do. The other thing nobody wants to forget or nobody wants to remember and wants to kind of sweep under the rug is that the vast majority of the criminal justice system changes that were put in place were done at the behest of black leaders to protect their communities. The Congressional Black Caucus led these changes. So when everybody screams about, oh my God, the uh, the sentencing, there's a huge sentencing disparity between the possession of crack cocaine and powder cocaine, and that shows intrinsic racism in the system. Well, that was the result of black leadership demanding those sentencing changes, okay, to protect their communities from all the crime that occurred from crack. The other thing I'd point out is that, you know, powder cocaine and crack cocaine, they kind of transport differently, they're used differently. Okay, there's another small drug that really screws with people, okay, that is small, portable, easily smoked. That's methamphetamine. If you compare the sentencing guidelines for crack and meth, you know, which tend to have some breakdown on our racial demographic lines, you know, I, I think that meth is still more of a, a white thing, for lack of better words, and, and crack has been traditionally more of a, a, a African-American drug. Um, the sentencing guidelines for meth and crack are the same thing because of the devastation those drugs have on their community. So I think educating yourself about the history, you know, you know, why we did these things, you know, um, to run on political philosophy for a while, there's just things called Chesterton's Wall. And, the, you know, it's a question about how you structure society. If you're walking across a, a field and there's just a fence down there for no apparent reason, you know, people of the liberal persuasion go, well, that's a stupid fence. Let's just tear it down. People of the conservative persuasion tend to go, OK, they didn't build that fence for nothing. Right. Let's see if we can figure out what that fence is there for. And, you know, a lot of these uh, actions that are being poo-pooed right now and trying to get taken away are those Chesterton's fence. You know, now that crime is down a little bit, people are like, going, well, maybe we don't, maybe, you know, that was never necessary. And, and that it was never necessary isn't true. Now, whether it's the best way to move forward is a reasonable question, but, you know, human nature doesn't change. You know, there are still that small uh, five to 10% of violent offenders that are going to keep doing what they've been doing. And, you know, we can't willy-nilly, you know, kind of, undo the protections we put in place or we shouldn't uh we certainly can do it we're getting ready you know california's already done that. <clears throat> yeah let's find out how that works <laughs> it'd be interesting to see the data ryan says elect judges and da's who understand that there are no victimless crimes and who are tough on crime yeah because right now it seems that we have a plethora of activist district attorneys across the united states who are uh choosing not to prosecute certain things and and i think that uh you know, eventually, the, the I think eventually we'll see, like, for those of us that grew up in the 70s, remember where New York City was heading. And, uh, you know, they didn't make uh, movies like Escape from New York and The Warriors and stuff like that in the 70s for no good reason. It, that's where New York was heading with the levels of crime that we saw. And it took someone like Rudy, Rudolph Giuliani to come in there with uh, his folks and clean it up. Well, and, but, you know, specifically what, what solved that problem was data-driven policing. And that's one of the okay. things that a lot of people want to poo-poo. But, you know, when we talked about what caused that spike to drive down is that for years it was thought that you can't stop crime, that crime is tied to poverty. And until you fix poverty, um, nothing's going to get better. Well, New York City just proved that was not the case. They sat there. They held their local precinct commanders, whatever. I, I'm sure that's not the title they used. But they started looking at where the crime was happening. They put the proper resources where they needed to be. And they were they were able to pull off what were you know effectively the impossible with what they did that during that time period, and that was largely the result of data driven policing. Yeah, I'm a huge fan. One of the things, one of the uh, points of data that you point out in your presentation, John, was that in California they found that on average criminals entering prison had committed 14 felonies in the previous three years. Let me say that again: 14 felonies in the previous three years. That is staggering. Well, yeah, and people, you know, don't stop to think. We talked about how poor the clearance rates are. Well, you know, again, 40% of our homicides are unsolved. Uh, only half of our aggravated assaults are uh, cleared. Only 30% of the robberies are cleared, okay? It's the same small group of people getting away with that. So you have to remember, you know, a lot of things have to happen for you to go to prison, you know? You have to, number one, obviously commit the act. You have to be identified. You have to be arrested. You have to be successfully prosecuted. They have to decide that prison is the best place to send you. So that's a lot of steps that have to take place to end up in that result. Yeah, I, I remember. And, you know, I was an investigator in the Marine Corps my last several years. And I, 
I remember watching uh, prosecutors just really, I mean, they were great Marine officers, but uh, as far as JAG attorneys, you know, it was brutal, man, to actually get clearance on some of these things. And I would think I had a slam dunk. I had worked on this case for months and months and months. I had bled in tears over this thing. And I knew from being a civilian uh, police officer, you know, I'm going to stack my charges with everything I can get because I know you're going to plea a lot of this stuff out. But still, to walk, watch people walk away was very frustrating with the system. But the system is imperfect, but it is what it is. But one of the things you said, you know, it's a very small majority of the folks that are committing the crime in here. And one of the stats that you actually showed with regard to career criminals is the majority of crimes, at least 60 percent, are committed by what percentage of criminals? And then you you said five to 10 percent, 20 to 25, 65 to 70. Now let me give you the actual stat. According to you, John, the majority of crimes, at least 60 percent, are committed by five to 10 percent of the criminals. And if we could just identify who those folks are um, through whatever means available uh, and, and put those folks away for a long time, maybe the rest of their natural life, we would have a pretty polite society. Yeah, and it's one of the things that I comment the uh, the presentation is you know that we've done there's research you can go out there and see the criminal activity of people after they've been released from prison for murder, and that's one of those things that just baffles me that we can even conduct that study. I mean, if you've shown the propensity and the ability to kill somebody. Um, the fact that we can go out there and study, you know, how many more crimes you commit after you're released from prison, um, that just baffles me. There's just, you know, uh, you know, you know, I, I'm not, not just, you know, there's capital punishment is a controversial subject, but certainly, you know, going away for 20, 25, 30 years. I mean, um, you know, very few people sentenced to a life sentence actually serve life. I mean, it's just amazing how willing we are to let these people back out there and give them a, the, well, I would say a second chance, but it's like their you know, fifth or 10th or 15th chance. Yeah. I read somewhere and I don't know if this is true or not, but it, something like the average time served on a life sentence is 6.7 years. Then that's based on doing 30%. Have you seen anything like that? Uh, I know there's some numbers out there that uh, even in the U S because you, because this varies from state to state. So, if the state, uh, if their prison is full, you're going to see a lot shorter sentences. I know at one point in time, I think in Tennessee, uh, the sentence for homicide was averaging about eight years because they were doing a one in a one in and a one out. In order to put somebody in prison, you had to release somebody. So that had a dramatic effect. You know, Texas had some interesting experiences with that where, you know, Texas just started building a lot of prisons, I think, back in the 80s. And, you know, um, when we talk about that big decrease in crime that we had since 91, you know, the, the, the researchers have different opinions on that. One thing that I found amazing was that the estimates of that uh, of that incarceration level had a either a zero percent effect up to a 25 percent effect rate. And I'm like, really? Zero. You put that many people who are shown to be committing acts and you're going to say it had a zero percent effect. Uh, I don't think anybody believes that whether it was uh, accounted for 25 percent of that. Uh, I don't know if we can say for sure. But, you know, when you start putting the bad people away from the good people where they can't commit these crimes, it just becomes harder to have that violent crime rate. Yeah. One of the key takeaways from your presentation is uh, another one that I, that was really floored me is it is estimated that of all violent victimizations and property crimes, only 3% result in a prison sentence. That, that is just uh, staggering because we know, like you said, as a predictor, John, that they're going to do it again. And they're going to do it again and again and again until they finally get some sort of uh, prison sentence out of the deal and get taken out of polite society. And it, it goes to uh, you know one of the big pernicious influences is just the media and TV. You know, everybody likes to watch these criminal justice shows where they identify a criminal. There's a trial. Um, they go to prison and everybody feels, you know, all warm and fuzzy. That's not representative of how the system works. I mean, there are no trials. I mean, you know, I think it's 97 percent of the federal system. 94 percent of the in the in the state system plea bargaining never go to trial so if you think that's how the criminal justice system works uh you're sadly misinformed yeah one of the things in your presentation you reference a book that i read and really enjoyed called freakonomics and, and one of the most controversial uh things that the two authors line out in uh, the book freakonomics and if you haven't read it folks let me let me tell you you should probably read it it will really blow your hair back but one of the things was was talking about how abortion, something like abortion, uh, really affected the the crime trends come down. Now I know you've looked at this, uh, John. Is this something that you saw as well? 
Well, I don't know if I did the actual research, but I've certainly read the books. And you know, I think what was important about the Freakonomics is that when they released that book, it was their most controversial finding. Uh, they received an inordinate amount of criticism. And what the authors did is they went back and said, you know, some of this criticism was valid. OK, we're going to reanalyze the data and, you know, reevaluate our conclusions based on the data we have. And they still found an effect. So what we were talking about, that was just, you know, trying to explain why violent crime started to, to go down uh, since, you know, the 1991 high point. And there are other explanations. And I think that there's no, excuse me, there's not a single explanation that does it. I think that each of these things contributed. But again, we mentioned data driven policing, things such as removing lead uh, from the environment. You know, uh, the, the lead has a huge effect on mental development, especially in kids. And, you know, we tend to see uh, lower IQs associated with higher, higher chances of violent criminalization, right? So if we remove substances from the environment that uh, reduce that retardation, we're gonna see natural effects of crime. You know, we mentioned the improvement in trauma care, that sort of a thing. And, and one of the things that the, has been pointed toward is just th the sad reality is, is the people most likely to commit violent crime were also the demographic most likely uh, to experience abortions. So that pool of potential offenders uh, Roe versus Wade, it was um, Supreme Court law in 1973, I believe, uh, probably had a dramatic effect on the, uh, the demographic group most likely to be committing crimes in the future. And again, if you look at that time frame, Roe versus Wade happens uh, in 73. Um, it takes about 20 years to mature, you know, that's a good age. So what you saw was just a dramatic reduction in that population. And again, um, it's not a popular opinion. You know, we can argue about abortion all day and still not reach an agreement. But to say that it had no effect, I think, is kind of pushing it. But it was probably one of several effects that really drove down crime in the 90s. Yeah. You know, among others, like you said, John, data driven policing, community policing. Uh, you've got longer incarceration rates, abortion. It's just one of many things, I'm sure, that had something to do with it. So uh, what got you into law enforcement in the beginning with, John? I know you mentioned that you were a dispatcher before you actually cross that line into doing the actual job yourself. But what, what drove you to that? Uh, so I was raised um, kind of in a, not like a hugely public safety channel, but kind of a public safety family. I grew up in very rural Virginia. I think the town population at the time I was growing up was about 300. Um, my uh, dad was in the fire department. I think about the time I turned 16, he was the chief of a fire department that my grandfather had founded. So I was kind of immersed in that um, public safety culture early. I kind of started out as a firefighter EMT. Um, you and I are from a different world, Rich. People aren't gonna believe this, but you know, when I was growing up, 16 year olds could ride on the fire truck and go fight fires. Uh, you know, I, I delivered a baby as an EMT when I was 17 years old. Now, I mean, 17 year olds can't even dress themselves, right? So this is just where, where we're headed, right? So, you know, I eventually got exposed to law enforcement. I started doing some ride alongs with, um, some local officers and found that I really enjoyed that. Um, you know, one of the things that I always was always kind of a challenge for me was I couldn't figure out where I wanted to go. And, and part of the reason I picked the agency that I worked with was at least initially in, in my career was we did all three uh, working, you know, large Western areas where there were no other public safety. So, you know, I worked out in uh, the Las Vegas area for about four years and that was an awesome job for me at that time. Um, you know, we had a fire truck, we had boats, we had patrol cars, we had four wheel, you know, uh, four wheel drive vehicles and we provide all the emergency services. So, you know, you'd go out and run calls Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you do reports Monday, Tuesday, off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday started, starts all over again. Uh, I would say that over the years, my interest in the fire and the EMS kind of waned, uh, where I am right now, there's just not that much chance to do EMS or fire or anything like that. So that was just kind of a natural calling of those interests down to the law enforcement officer. So, you know, I was immersed in it as a family. Um, you know, there's really only two reasons that, you know, people become law enforcement with the data tell us is it's either to serve their community or they, they're looking for a stable job. Those are the two big motivators. And it was definitely, a, you know, serving my community. I, you know, I was a volunteer firefighter and EMT for, for a lot of years. Uh, did that Richmond, Virginia, Williamsburg, Virginia, that kind of stuff. So it was just it was something I was kind of born into. And I just kind of, you know, ended up in the law enforcement side. I mean, I think if the fire in, you know, fire engines had guns, too, I would have probably stayed there. But, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed uh, the firearms aspect of the law enforcement. That was something that was particularly appealing as well. Yeah. Thank you to the 34 folks that are still with us. Please like and share. We got a lot more to cover with John Hearn this morning. And uh, thank you to everyone that are listening out there in the podcast to come. Jerry is on. I'm going to mispronounce your name again. Gil 
is it Gilly or Guile? Guile, good morning. I'm happy to have you from the Philippines. Jarrah is on. Uh, every, everybody's on this morning. Really appreciate you guys being on this morning. You mentioned that you and I are from a different world, and, and that's so true, man. I got married a month out of high school, still married to my high school sweetheart 30-plus years later. And by the time I was able to drink, I'd already done two deployments as a Marine. And I heard someone say yesterday, it's like, well, this guy, you know, he's 27. He's practically still a kid. I'm like, by the time I was 27, I'd served six years as a Marine. I'd been around the world three times. I was a law enforcement officer with two kids, and I'm like, I was in no way a child. And I, I don't know if we just grew up quicker back then, which is odd because we didn't have access to information like they do today. But I don't know what's driving that, John, but I think you're right. I mean, today it's uh, they're just there's a lack of maturity that, that I don't know that I can explain it. I mean, I'll just take a quick shot of that. You know, number one, people are having less kids. So each kid is more precious. Right. Um, there's a uh, people are tending to have kids later in life. So they tend to have more resources that they can dote on their kids with. So those are the, the two really big trends that have kind of been driving that infantilization, you know, process that we're seeing. Uh, it's just, you know, it's crazy to me. You know, you, you hear about the, you know, the, the only thing I wanted to do, I think in Virginia was you had to be 15 years and eight months was to get that learner's permit. And now you hear about kids not getting their driver's license until their 20s. And it's like, that's what every kid I grew up with wanted was, you know, their driver's license so they could get out of the house. And now apparently nobody wants to leave the house. Oh yeah. My parents purposely made it miserable so we couldn't wait to get out of the house. It's not a place you wanted to hang around if I promise you that. And let's get back to your career. And I want to ask you because you've spent, you know, the entirety probably of your adult life in uniform. What in your opinion, John, is the purpose of law enforcement in America? Uh, I think it has two big goals, um, you know, to protect people and their property. And the thing that once everybody gets kind of short shrift to, but, you know, you know, maintain order, I think is still important because that's the, you know, maintaining order goes back to the quality of life issues. Um, basically being able to live where you are, you know, if you've got neighbors blasting music at three o'clock in the morning, that has a huge impact on your quality of life. Now, um, you shouldn't have to tell people that's rude and inconsiderate, but obviously some people can't. And, you know, just that, you know, basically keeping society habitable, for lack of better words, and protecting people and property seem to be the big reasons to me for law enforcement. Protecting people and property. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I've recently had a very liberal friend of mine who I love dearly, dearly, dearly. Uh, this man is a mentor and someone that I would you know, do anything for, but he said something that was really indicative of what we hear and see on the left. And that, and that is that he said, you know, rich walls don't work. <laughs> and I, I just let it go and we enjoyed our wine and our meal and I, I moved on, but I, cause I did not want to engage with that. Cause just the fact that he said it is so it's just anathema to me and to, to logic because if walls don't work, take yours down. Uh, if walls don't work, why do we have them in prisons? You know, it just, it defies any sense of logic. We have to have walls to, to keep out those that want to play by the rules and those that want to play within the rules and color within the lines, man. What do you say, John? Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's, you know, uh, the Vatican has a wall around it, right? Yes, so obviously right. walls work. I mean, um, there's just a lot of um, naivete. You know, I think that the problem is, is that, you know, there's that, that classic, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but, you know, hard times breed hard men, hard men, you know, wage war, they make things good good times breed soft people, which bring more war. And this is the cycle we're in. And the only reason that person can just naively blather on about that is they have been completely insulated from the potential consequences of what they're pushing. You know, if he doesn't think walls work, take the lock, you know, locks off his front door, you know, leave the keys in the ignition to his car sitting out, that sort of a thing. If you don't think that the, the walls work, um, you're just denying reality. I mean, you, you know, one of the things I talked about, and I think they get short shifted, just some of the stuff you can do to protect yourself from property crime. That stuff demonstrably works, you know, uh, you know that. So it's just it's a frank denial of reality is what we're facing. Yeah, and let's talk about some of those things because uh, one of the things you mentioned is taking the three inch decking screws and replacing all of the uh, in all your doors and stuff like that. And, and that's something that I, some of my, I, as soon as you said that in your presentation, I'm like, holy cow, I have some of those that way, but not all of them. So I'm going to buy a big bucket, you know, big bucket of decking screws. And, and me and my son are going to go around probably this weekend 
and change out all the screws in our doors to make them a little bit more hard. And you talk about hurricane film. So you actually in your presentation, and I encourage you if you haven't seen it to watch it, some of the little things you can do to harden your castle and keep you got keep you and your family safer. So I appreciate that. Uh, TC says walls work, but we also put doors on them. Yeah, exactly. Elkie says, um, let's see. Elkie says, I don't have kids. I'm just theorizing, but our kids raised snowflakes because we spoiled our kids. Yeah, we did. You know, and I think part of that was I didn't want my kids to grow up like I did. I mean, I love my parents, but, uh, they, like I said, they made life pretty miserable in a lot, of, a lot of ways. So my wife and I were like, we just graduated high school. We love each other. Let's, let's run. And we did. TC said walls, uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Tiny says walls and guns worked in DC, right? Yeah, that was funny. You know, it's just like Chaz. It's just like Chaz, you know, the this Occupy Seattle movement that controlled the, that area. The, what is the first thing they did? They did exactly what they said they didn't like about the Trump administration. They put up walls. They had men with guns enforcing their own little bizarre laws. I mean, everything that they said they were against, they did immediately once they had territory. Because it's about control. Yeah. And again, we saw, uh, you know, the uh, President Biden coming into power behind a 12 foot security wall. And it's like, guys, you know, walls work. I mean, you can not like them all day long, but they to say they have no effect is is complete BS. John, one of the things that folks like here on Coffee with Rich is for me to ask the guests about their best day and their worst day. And I would uh, throw that to you, sir. What can you tell us about your best day and your worst day? Uh, is that like a law enforcement, I guess, kind of thing question or? Sure. It, law enforcement related or just your life, whatever. Uh, so, you know, law enforcement career wise, um, it was interesting. You, you gave me that heads up on that question. It's like I was sitting here thinking, I'm like, I can come up with a lot more worst days than I can best days. Right. <laughs> um, that's just I think that's the, the people that just don't appreciate that. Right. So, um, you know, best day in law enforcement. Uh, one of the things I think if you're a criminal justice practitioner, is just you're frustrated with how people manage to fall through the cracks. Uh, so some years ago. Uh, one of our guys makes a traffic stop on somebody and the dude gives officer a fake name that he cannot spell. Well, my friends that in, in law enforcement, we call a clue, right? So, uh, our officer goes to order the guy to a kneeling handcuffing position. He runs, tries to taser the dude, the darts get stuck in the trees. Um, you know, you call the local PD for a canine track. And of course, everything's political these days. Uh, they won't do a canine track unless it's a, a felony crime that this guy's fleeing for. Um, it takes us some time to realize that he is running because he does have a felony probation warrant. So by the time we get a dog there, um, dude's just long gone. You know, he just hits the trail, runs, gets a ride. But he left, you know, he left the car there and left his cell phone there. So we were again able to identify him. And, you know, we kind of really want this guy. Uh, it turns out that he was on probation for um, uh, he was a gang member. Uh, had a long history of going between two communities, commit crimes in an area, go hang out in the other, that kind of thing. So he was a long term bad actor. And he uh, the way Mississippi was doing it at the time was your, you know, if you get sentenced for that possession with intent, a lot for that first offense, a lot of time they'll give you a fairly like you'll go serve a small sentence like a year, but they'll hang nine over you. Right. So this guy owed he had violated his probation. He owed nine years in parchment prison, which I mean, is, a, is a, in, in fairness, is a pretty good reason to run. And this was before the Supreme Court decision on GPS trackers. Uh, we borrowed a GPS track and we're like, this guy is stupid enough. You know, because he, he claimed they claimed it was his girlfriend's car. This guy is stupid enough that he'll get back in this vehicle if we give him some time. So we put the GPS tracker on him and we just, you know, were patient and waited. And sure enough, uh, what you know, wait about four weeks and, you know, you start going and sure enough, you see the GPS ping, you drive past. Yeah, that's our dude. So, um, you know. At the time, we couldn't, you can't do an, uh, an arrest without an uh, operations plan. We just knew the guy was driving the vehicle, so we get everything set up. This time, we were smart. We had a uh, uh, canine unit from the Highway Patrol go out, do our surveillance, and this guy is bebopping down this rural country road, minding his own business, because um, he had done this, uh, they're running from the police multiple times, so he was experienced with it, and it was an awesome feeling. Everything's going good. We're in unmarked cars. Uh, light him up with the marked Highway Patrol unit. He pulls into this... Um, just random driveway and gets out and it's like in a sprinter stance and he hears that dog bark and he just froze <laughs> and uh, getting him into custody was just awesome. You know, it was a long-term process. I, this was a guy that had literally been slipping through the cracks for years 
And being able to bring him in uh, was just something satisfying because nobody else had bothered to do it. I mean, and there's uh, sadly, there's a ton of stories out there. There's, you know, way more bad guys that, that need that kind of attention than there are officers willing to, to go out and do it. And just, you know, the number of officers to be able to do it. So that was, you know, that was definitely a good day. Um, some of the bad days, uh, you know, one, one that, you know, I guess immediately comes to mind. Uh, I worked a, a really horrible uh, motor vehicle crash. Um, mom fell asleep, drifted off the road, overcorrected, and there was a she hit the a bridge abutment that was going over a county road. Uh, vehicle went off, fell vertically, probably 15 feet, rotated 180 degrees, and landed on the gas tank. In the back seat of that thing were a little four year old girl and two kids under 18 months. The little four year old girl was able to get herself uh, when the car hits, it catches on fire. A little four year old girl was able to get herself out of the car. Uh, passerby grabbed mom and dad out but uh dude those you know dealing with the you know i dealt with um dead kids before i dealt with people who burned up before but you know just that was a really heavy day to deal with you know two kids under 18 months that had burned up that that's definitely one of the ones that sticks there and then you know i had a, i lost one of my fellow officers uh we graduated from the academy in june or july uh he was murdered august 9th of 2002 and uh losing him was bad enough but i went up and saw uh when his name was placed on the ball in DC and uh, just the absolute grief his mom went through was just devastating. I mean, you know, there's nothing like a, a mother mourning the loss of their child. And, you know, she had a righteous child. He was a much better dude than I would ever be. And, you know, watching a mother suffering at the loss of her you know, child, um, you know, he, he, it sounds crazy, but I mean, he, he was shot by a Mexican heart, you know, cartel hitman that had entered the country illegally. And, you know, that's, you know, why I'm kind of a fan of walls because, you know, they, they certainly do work in some areas. Yeah, that, that's a, uh, that's tough. I remember being in the police Academy, John, and one of the things that they told us was, you know, if you look at the Vietnam Memorial wall there in DC, uh, it begins and it ends. If you look at the, any of the other Memorial walls, they have a beginning and ending. The law enforcement Memorial is the only one that has plenty of room to go. There's plenty of space left to carve names in. And I thought, man, that's a that's a heavy one. And he goes, society is telling us, law enforcement officers, that they expect more of you to die. And I'm like, wow. And, and you know, my frustration with that, just to chime in here real quickly for the LEOs that are working there, is that that list, that 10 reasons why law enforcement officers die, it's the same thing it was. That, that you know, that list was written down in the 60s. And when you look, if you research it, it goes back to the 50s. And officers continue to die for the same reasons, whether it's, you know, poor searches, not paying attention to the hands and stuff like that. But, you know, some of those are effectively best practices we've learned. And as we're trying to reform our criminal justice system, they are literally encouraging us to do the things that we know get us killed. So it's one of my frustrations is, number one, you know, don't do those things. We know what they are. You know, make sure you're getting adequate sleep. Uh, you're conducting good searches. You, you keep your skills up. But, you know, then to have a society, at least a portion of our society going, yeah, all that stuff that's likely to get you killed. We want you to do more of that. That's just one of those things that drives me crazy. Yeah, it does. Uh, Will says, in reference to the three inch screws in the door frames, I love the guard line sensors gives me some advance warning that someone is in the is on the property well before they reach the house. Yeah, you'll Will, you'll have to send us a link to that one. I'd, I'd like to get that out there, especially if you recommend it. Gerald says, where can we see John Hearn's presentation and work? John, where would you like to direct them to? So that's uh, in the process. Uh, I'm really stepping out this year, trying to get my own thing going. Uh, uh, Rangemaster.com is, I've been associated with Tom Gibbons since 2001. Under the staff is a link there. Uh, I have a website that has just started. It's jhearn.com, but there's not much there. I've got to get some, I've got some upcoming classes coming. Uh, the webinar was a, a bigger success than I thought it was. So I think the plan is I'm going to go back uh, people specific, you know, because there was a lot of data about crime and then a lot of information on criminals themselves. Uh, the second part of that was what everybody wanted to hear of. So I think my plan would be to uh, go and revamp that and dig more into the, the criminal nature side of things. Uh, so I don't have anything scheduled right now. Um, if you give me about a week, my uh, road class schedule for lectures and stuff like that will be up. And uh, I'll probably be doing a seminar, uh, some variation of the crime seminar and probably doing something on my take on dry practice, you know, later this year. So jhern.com website's not updated right now. Give me, give me a couple of weeks and it'll be good to go. Yeah. And 
in the show notes for today, you'll see the two links to range masters and jhern.com. So if you want to just click on those links, probably might be easier than trying to write it down. Uh, Mr. Jackson in the Philippines says it's funny. Some laws don't really favor the citizen like my country. And uh, he's in the Philippines he says I shoot someone defending my home, but I still end up in jail and I stay in jail for months until it has been proven self-defense. Hello. The man entered my home to kill me and my girlfriend. It's not, and it's not self-defense. Yeah, it's uh, laws are not necessarily designed to favor the criminal. I, I mean, favor the innocent party. I would imagine. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, Will says I wasn't able to attend the webinar. Is there a replay? I think we just covered that. Okay, John. Let's look at our next question here that I had for you. What is the state of law enforcement today? Here we are, 2021. It's been a wild ride in 2020, and 2021 is setting up to be an even wilder ride, perhaps. What is the state of law enforcement, John? So, you know, and again, obviously I care about history and trends. I think you could push that back to, you know, 2015 and the beginning of the Ferguson effect. Um, the data out there continues to show that the Ferguson effect is probably real. You know, um, one of the things that I find very disappointing is that people in the field of criminal justice itself um, – are very woke these days and don't do research that won't render findings that they like. So you have to almost go and look at like, for instance, economists have done some really good work on crime. Uh, a great study came out recently where, uh, you know, a lot of patrol cars have uh, GPS devices on them. And you can literally know where every patrol car is in the city at any given instance. And this crazy researcher, God bless him, went out there and took like all the data from 2009 for Dallas PD, because this whole, the thought has been is that patrol does not affect crime. Uh, there was some earlier, you know, the Kansas City Preventive Patrol experiment was an example of that, right? But, you know, what we're seeing now is that the presence of policing, especially police that are working, does still have a huge impact on crime. So what I think we're seeing is a bifurcation. You've got areas in which law enforcement is continuing to work and be supported in. Dude, I can't, you know, I would say, you know, uh, over a two week time, uh, somebody probably buys me lunch at least once in that two week time when I'm out. I work in an area that is largely still supportive of law enforcement. Uh, the prosecutions tend to do their prosecutors tend to do their job, that sort of thing. What I think you're going to see is this separation, you know, of areas where people are supportive of the police. The police continue to work in a proactive fashion and uh, you get the, everything you'd expect from that. Right. Uh, decreased crime, maybe uh, bad people, more bad people in prison. Uh, the other side of that is that the areas that do not want proactive policing are going to get all the consequences that decision doesn't come from. And again, because we're bifurcating here, um, uh, what's going to happen is all those people that used to be in, you know, the, in the areas that are, have a heavy law enforcement presence, they're going to go where the presence isn't. So what I see is this continued separation between areas which want a strong law and order presence and those that don't. Um, you know, I don't see... Uh, people are too fat and rich in this country, I think, to really do a civil war. Everybody seems to worry about that. I think you're just going to see this gradual separation of groups into interests, you know, it, it is the future of law enforcement. Um, again, we're pretty supportive where we are. Um, we've caught some grief, you know, that kind of thing um, uh, over stops that are, you know, perfectly lawful, but people want to complain about them, uh, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, uh, play the race card, play their, you know, whatever their, their card of the day is. So some of that stuff goes on, but it hasn't affected me where I work. But there's plenty of areas that have just literally shut down. Um, and the data shows that when the police stop doing their job, crime goes up. So, you know, if you want the police to do less, just be willing to take the consequences that come with that. Yeah, and I want to talk I want to talk to some of that. Um, Bill says John teaches other things as well. Yes, he does. Uh, you want to check out more about all the things that John can teach? Please check out his website or Range Master. Alan Kelly is on. Finally, he says, Alan says, running late again, finished up a quick class. Coin number 1571 from Occupied Virginia. Alan, of course, is a retired Virginia State Police Officer. You know, you mentioned that uh, this bifurcation. And I, I have a friend who's a very successful uh, guy in South Africa. And he talked about how, and you know, pre-1994, the police had been used primarily a, as a tool of apartheid. So there was a, when Nelson Mandela came to power, there was a large push to defund the police uh, because the community saw them as nothing but a, a tool of the government to, to, for oppression. So, okay, no problem. So we defund the police. 
But he's like, Rich, I, I'm a rich guy. I live with a bunch of other rich South Africans. We have giant walls around our community, our little uh, subdivision, and we have ex special forces guys driving around in bear cats armed to the teeth all day long. So uh, go ahead and defund the police. It means nothing to us. We still are able to afford a level of uh, security and law enforcement presence. So again, this idea of defunding the police really only impacts, in my opinion, those that are not as fortunate as others. Am I wrong in that assumption? Yeah. I, you know, I think the people that have the, the biggest interest in protecting minority communities these days are, in fact, the police. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you can't roll up on a scene and watch somebody take their last breath and not want to do something to make that better. And, you know, Americans have you know similar issues with with the history of policing. You know, there's no denying that. But, you know, Bull Connor could not get a job in American law enforcement today. That's not what we're doing. You know, um, those days are long gone. And the problem is, I mean, that was, I mean, we're talking the early 60s. That is a lot of decades past. And the vast majority of law enforcement officers just want to protect the innocent. Um, and, you know, we can argue about who is necessary the innocence, but, you know, this is, this is the direction we're heading in. Absolutely, those that can afford the protection are gonna have it. You know, the other interesting, the other interesting Part of this is this is largely, I think, a rural versus an urban um, issue, and that's why you know you, you know you dropped in their civil war. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen just because you know the American Civil War you had clearly defined geographic territories that are separated. Now every state has an urban center that tends to drive the politics and all the rural lying out uh, rural outlying areas, and the you know there are huge differences between the crime in rural areas and the cities. So. The wealthy people in the dense urban areas are going to remain protected. The poor people in the urban areas are going to continue to be victimized. I mean, if violent crime rates go up, the vast majority of those victims are going to be people in the bottom quintile of income earners, the poor. So, um, you know, somebody wise, I can't remember which conservative commentator once said this, but, you know, at some point we have to stop evaluating policies by their stated intentions and judge them solely on their effects. And the effects of these policies are going to be ugly. <laughs> you know, it just, that's just the nature of the beast. We, we've been here before. We're going to probably be here again. Um, you know, be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. Yeah. That's an, that's an interesting point, John. I've always found the the law of unintended consequences to be fascinating. Like, uh, you know, if you Louisville is the probably where it really dawned on me first when I was an operations officer in Louisville, I was, driving from the city center out and you would see these big, beautiful stately homes. And then as you drove further out uh, down this one street, the homes got smaller and smaller and smaller and the alleyways got longer and narrow, narrower and the houses got longer and narrower. And I'm like, why the hell is this? And then I did an, e uh, I think it was the economics class or something. And it says, well, city planners decided in a lot of these cities in the in the in the twenties or before that we're going to tax people based on the amount of street frontage that your house occupies. That's going to be a great way. We're going to tax these rich fat cats. And all it did was make, okay, good. That's how you're going to tax me. My house will still cover the same amount of square foot, only it's going to be long, narrow alleyways. And, and of course, those have unintended consequences. Those long alleyways uh, is where a lot of the problems became. So, it's one of those things that just scratch your head. Do we never consider the consequences of some of the things that we do? Well, it's, it's about incentives and disincentives. I mean, that's just the basics of economics. If you create incentives for something, you're going to get more of it. If you create disincentives for it, you're going to get less of it. We are creating huge disincentives for proactive policing. So we're going to get less of it. Yeah. So my good friend TC is on this morning. Good morning, TC. Thank you to the 41 folks that are joining. TC, of course, is a retired FBI agent. And he says, how's that police defunding working out in Minneapolis? Yeah, not so well. You know, but, uh, you know, probably violent crime overall is going to be a little bit lower this year. Uh, and that sounds good, except that, you know, violent crime is a result of people interacting. So, you know, like violent crime tends to go up in the summer because people are interacting more. But, dude, you look at some of these major urban areas, homicide is going to be off the charts this year uh, because of that defunding policing message. You know, uh, uh, interesting, you know, a couple interesting stories to share if, in case you haven't seen the news is that New York City used to have um, uh, basically officers working in plain clothes in unmarked vehicles in high crime areas. They were, you know, in, in a lot of urban areas have this, you know, some were called jump out boys and stuff like that. And what happened was because of the controversy about, you know, 
unmarked officers, unmarked cars. New York City stopped doing that. And what immediately happened was the incentive structure changed. It used to be that if you were looking down the street and went to know if you, if you could do a shooting, you never knew if one of those cars parked there might be full of cops. Well, all of a sudden, if you look out and if there's no marked patrol car out there, you know you're good to do your deed. Then all of a sudden, people were, you know, it's a lot easier to do that. And I think they've had to back off and restore those units. And if, you know, for that to be recognized within like a six month period really tells you how important that type of policing is to keep everybody safe. Yeah, great, great point. Jara says, um, she brought up an interesting point. We were talking about South Africa. She said South Africa is now under attack by those same oppressed people. And uh, yeah, if you look at the farm murders, what's going on, and we've had uh, guests on here from South Africa before, attorneys and such, and one of the commandos All or right. something like that. What's that? Uh, you were you were doing your uh, your internet fade out, and I was going to have to take over like you warned me. But you, you came back. You're back with us. Hey, all right, I'm back. Yeah, we have terrible Wi-Fi out here. But anyway, he, he uh, one of our guests on Coffee with Rich said that uh, in South Africa, the farmers, you know, would band together and create these quasi commando units, and they could get a quick reaction force from other farmers to their house. And then the um, the president came in. I can't remember who it was. It was after Nelson Mandela, and said. We're going to disband these units, guys, because we got something better coming. Turn in your rifles, turn in your equipment that we gave you. Uh, stand down. I got something better coming. Nothing better ever came. The criminals know it, and the farmers are helpless out there, and and uh, and they're just attacking them. Let's see. Um, Allen says defunding is not the only way they are going after the police. The legislature in Virginia is trying to remove quote qualified immunity from law enforcement. What are your thoughts on that, John? So that's one of those things that. Uh, Again, people don't understand what they're talking about, right? So when people talk about removing qualified immunity, they take the most 0.1% of cases and see, hey, look, qualified immunity is horrible. Well, number one, why was qualified immunity created? Uh, the concept of qualified immunity is I am, a, when I'm working, I am a government agent. And if I am doing what my employer tells me to, I shouldn't get in trouble for that. That's what qualified immunity comes down to. If I'm following established guidelines, precedents, that kind of stuff, and I'm acting within that scope, then I'm protected. Because I mean, think about how hesitant an officer would be to intercede in an event if he knew he was personally liable for everything he did. Well, I'm sorry, if he's following uh, departmental guidelines, carrying proper equipment, that kind of stuff, the whole idea of qualified immunity, and it doesn't just extend to police, it extends to pretty much anybody working for the government, is if you're doing what your employer has told you to do, then the consequences, if there's negative consequences, they should fall on the employer not the employee, right? And, you know, I, I'll just throw this out there as another example, because we always, when we talk about qualified immunity, they take the most extreme cases. Well, I have a friend uh, that pulled a lady over for speeding, and she's basically a crazy lady, uh, won't sign the ticket. He has to physically arrest her because she won't sign the ticket, takes him to jail, right? Or take, ends up taking her to jail. Well, she sues him uh, because her incarceration gave her brain cancer. That was the basis of her suit, is that because she was arrested, um, she got brain cancer. Well, qualified immunity protects that officer right then and there for doing his job. Never mind that that actually had to go up several levels of courts for some judge to decide, yeah, being placed in handcuffs in the back of a patrol car probably doesn't cause brain cancer, but that officer was protected by qualified immunity. So if you, again, it's a matter of incentives and disincentives. If you want to create an, a, a disincentive structure, where you make every employee operating within the scope of their duties liable for those actions, they're not going to do anything. Now, it, on the other hand, if you want to say, hey, if you're doing what we asked you to do in the way that you asked you to do it, then we're going to protect you. You know, it's a matter of which one you find most or least favorable. Pick one. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Tony, Tony says, remove qualified immunity from activist prosecutors. Uh, I think that's that might be an interesting way to go. Uh, prosecutors have absolute immunity. Let's not forget that. Uh, prosecutors have a different level of immunity in their day-to-day -day interactions. It's an absolute immunity, not a qualified immunity. I did not know that. Wow. Absolute immunity. I'm going to read up on that. That's yeah, unless they are grossly, gro unless they're criminal, they're protected from any decisions they make. You know, if, if they plea bargain and do kill somebody the next day, same thing with judges. You know, we, we see these cases, you know, there was one out in San Francisco where the judge released somebody because he wasn't a harm. And then like, I think like the next day or certainly the next week, he kills a police officer. That judge has absolute immunity for that decision. So you know, it's just the nature of the beast. 
Yeah. And I recently read Malcolm Gladwell's excellent book, uh, Talking to Strangers. And there's a, uh, I don't know if you've read it, John, but uh, there's a point in there where they, the New York City judges that uh, determined bail amounts for people. And then they looked at that relative recidivism rates on those decisions that judges make. And they thought, well, these judges see people all the time. Surely they have good decision making on who is a threat to the community or not. And their stats were abysmal. So then they took the same group of stats and they let like veteran law enforcement officers look at that, uh, prosecutors, defense attorneys, CIA agents. They, they put this data in front of a lot of people. Nobody could make good decisions on it. And then they turned AI loose on it and AI had like an 80 or 90 percent effective rate. But again, the reasons why AI was so effective uh, was racially biased and, and socioeconomically biased. It was a whole host of things that AI is like, Oh, this is a, this is a trait. We need, this is a predictor. And, and anyway, they had to, the study does, does, did not really, uh, wasn't really PC because the idea was that maybe we can't turn AI loose on it. I don't know. It was interesting reading. Sometimes we don't like the answers we get. So we just ignore them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's look at our next question here. I know I've kept you on here for quite some time, John, and I really appreciate your time this morning. Having seen the events of 2020, where's all this lawlessness going, man? I've been asking the same question for all of our guests for about a year now, and I'm always interested to hear your opinion on it. I think you're going to have the areas that tolerate it are continuing to get, uh, worse. I mean, that, you know, what we're effectively doing is removing the police from these areas. And I think the, the troubling thing to me is that um, we're seeing a lot more prosecutions of cases that are pretty clearly self-defense. And everybody forgets that, you know, that the, a lot of times the process is the punishment, okay? They know as a prosecutor that they cannot get a conviction for this crime, that they're gonna lose. But it's important to them that they, they know how horrible the system is, so they're gonna run you through it anyway. So I think, um, you know, People are going to end up moving over this. I mean, I think we're starting to see some migrations. People are going to start to move where they're safer. The you know, remember the people that can't move are the poor. You know, so I think that uh, the long term trend it's heading toward is that things are certainly going to get worse before they get better. And you're going to see people deciding to move uh, to areas that have law and order when they when they decide that's important enough. Yeah, that's a great point. The the mobility right now. And, and that's why it kind of leads into the next question about civil war, civil unrest is because we're already seeing that flight from California. You know, some of the stats that I saw last year was to rent a U-Haul in California. It costs thousands of dollars, not the 1995 one way you normally see. It's like, well, because we have to literally go pick up these vehicles, these U-Hauls in uh, Texas and bring them back to, because nobody's coming into California. And, and like you said, John, the poor can't move. They don't have the ability to move. And if they're clamoring for defund the police, those that can afford to move are moving. I think we just see the slide continue to go down. What do you think? I, I think that's a long term trend. It's not just California. Um, there has been some, you know, as you know, states continue to tax heavily. You've seen, you know, I think there was some really heavy movement from Illinois, from New York State as well. So, you know, I think you're going to see a lot of flight to these you know, tax you know, I don't know, the, the places where liberty still exists a little bit more. Let, let's be frank about that. Um, and the only concern I have is that, you know, please don't make Texas, California. You know, yeah. the problem is, is these people tend to, to flee to these areas and bring with them the same decisions that got them where they were before. You know, Arizona is a very different state today than it was 20 years ago before all the Californians got there. I'm not saying that Californians ruin everything they touch, but it certainly seems to be they ruin most of the things they touch. Yeah. And I know we here in Tennessee, I live on a, a little road in the middle of nowhere. And I think there's only like two native Tennesseans on this rural country road. Everybody else is from, you know, Detroit or California or somewhere. And it's like, guys, you're welcome to come to Tennessee, but, but please don't bring your craziness here. And I was listening to a podcast recently, John, and for those that are, this is an interesting little quick story. The guy says, so, He's a gun friendly guy and he leaves California and he says, I want to start a range in Tennessee. So he goes to the, um, the, the local County and he's like, Hey, what do I need to do to build a range? And they're like, do you own the land? I'm like, well, yeah. Okay. They go build your range and you're out in the County. So no Norse ordinance don't pertain to you. So go for it. So he says, okay. 
So he goes, like, I got to rent some bulldozers to knock these trees down and stuff. I guess I need to get some permits. What do I need to get to cut the trees down on my property? And he's like, do you own the trees on your property? He's like, yeah, they go, go bulldoze the trees. So he goes to rent the bulldozer. And he's like, I'll probably have to take 40 hour classes on the bulldozer and all this stuff. He's like, no, here you got a driver's license. Yeah. Okay. Here, here's a bulldozer. What do you mean to deliver it to? So he pushes all the trees into a pile after he cuts them. He's like, I got to burn the trees. I guess I got to go down to get a burn permit. So he goes to get a burn permit. And they're like, uh, are those your trees on your property? I'm like, yeah, go burn them. And uh, he's like, I couldn't believe it. He's like, this is what freedom is. And he he went on and on and on with with that ex same example. And I think it's, it's fascinating because people that live under those kind of uh, rules and that sort of nanny state to, to use the quote, uh, they have no idea what it's really like to live in a place like Texas or Tennessee or perhaps Oklahoma. And to Elkie's point, he said, you know, Colorado is is becoming a California. And, and that's that's a shame uh, that those kind of policies and Alan Kelly will tell us that in one election cycle, you know, Virginia went from being a very pro to a gun friendly place to Governor Northam coming in and, and the Congress and state uh, Senate for Virginia just completely being gone in one election cycle. It's amazing. Uh, that, that's where I'm from. And I, I, every time I, almost every time I call my folks, I hear about the, the latest, greatest ideas they've had. So, you know, you know, I always joke that uh, I was, you know, that Virginia ended at the Rappahannock river because everything North of there was just an extension of DC. And that's certainly, that's no longer the case. It's the entire state has been affected by that. Yeah. A Alan says, don't know how to take your statements. Qualified immunity is to protect you from doing right. Does it protect if negligence, criminal and different actions by the law enforcement? Yeah, I think I, the way I understood your your remarks, John, is, you know, qualified immunity. If you're doing the right thing under the color of law, you're good to go. Yeah. And just real quick, you know, qualified immunity. There's a two prong test is it's first off, did you violate a clearly established right? OK, uh, I'm sorry. Did you did you violate a, a, a right? And number two, was it clearly established at the time, right? And, you know, was it clearly established at the time is what tends to get everybody huffed up um, as far as that goes. But the again, the purpose of qualified immunity is to protect government employees working within within their scope. And that's, you know, if you want to lose qualified immunity, um, you operate outside of your scope. Um, you know, if we've got the time, you know, one of the more interesting cases I cite when I teach firearms is uh, Stamps versus Framingham which was a case um, involving the, the application of the safety on an AR-15. Uh, they go to serve an arrest warrant at a, a house. Uh, they know there's a 60 some year old man that has no criminal history. I think he's the father of the suspect they're looking for, but they go to serve the warrant. The SWAT team goes in, uh, they put the old man down on the ground. He's not uh, in restraints or anything. Uh, after the, as the team's clearing the rest of the house, the officer approaches the, the older gentleman and goes to secure him with handcuffs, his rifle in D's and kills the gentleman which is a straight up tragedy, right? And what they, the conclusion they reached was, you know, the judges concluded that his, uh, the safety was off and his finger was on the trigger. Uh, if you're in the gun world and have ever worn all that kit stuff, I think what happened was his safety was off and the trigger got caught on his kit. But irregardless, had the safety been applied, that gun would not have gone off. And that officer actually lost his qualified immunity because it was well established that the safety should have been on. So, you know, qualified immunity does not protect everything. Um, if you are so gross and negligent as to, you know, run around in an AR without the safety on once the, the, the scene is secure, you're not going to get qualified immunity. And again, by focusing on the exceptional cases, they really, really warp the perspective of what's really going on with qualified immunity. Yeah. And if you've been in law enforcement any length of time, you're going to get sued. <laughs> I promise you, I think all my friends that have been in law enforcement, now most of it never, ever goes to trial. It's eventually thrown out, but it's just the idea of the stress that you and your family have to go through uh, while, you know, some dirt bag that you put in handcuffs is is trying to destroy your life is, is terrible. With blatant lies. And, and that's the thing, one of the things I love, the, you know, one of the few improvements over the years I'd say is the rise of body cameras. Because, uh, you know, what everybody forgets is it's like the vast majority, and we're talking like 95% of the complaints filed against law enforcement officers are unfounded, okay? And with that five, of that 5% that are founded, um, that something was done wrong, a lot of times it's like the trooper didn't have his hat on, right? It's a policy violation. It's not wrongdoing by the officer. And, you know, th that whole complaint process, you know, we have a, a tiered system of complaints, you know, whether it's a local or regional or a national complaint, Having been the focus of a national complaint and eventually being exonerated, 
dude, I lost sleep over that. So forget being sued. You know, again, a lot of times the process is the punishment. So it, it's not fun for, you know, uh, anybody involved in that. Yeah, I, I went through it uh, even as an investigator in the military, you know, the, uh, with an unlawful command influence charge that like me and the, uh, me and the, uh, what was the claim that me and the convening authority for the court martial had conspired against this guy, not all of his, you know, not all of the crimes that he committed, but we had somehow we're, we're in a conspiracy to get this guy. I'm like, man, I got better things to do than hunt down Marines doing wrong. I mean, come on. But, and it was eventually, but again, you, you, you got to go through the process and the process is painful. Uh, Brett Parker says, good morning, uh, gentlemen, coin number 876. Elkie says, folks have to bring the political beliefs to where they move because that's what they believe. The left has simply been more successful by taking over the education and media over the last 40 years. PJ Tahoe says, anytime we travel somewhere, I always wish I had an extra set of non-California license plates to put on. Live here, but not a Californian, Ohio. Uh yeah. So uh, let's get to the last question. You know, we talked loosely about, you know, in 2021, are we going to see some sort of civil unrest, civil war, anything like that? Uh, we had a really good article written by T.C. Fuller, who's on this morning. Check it out at AmericanWarriorSociety.com. And and one of the things that T.C. talks about is how we got to where we're where we are. And then let's look at where we could go. And a limited low intensity conflict in some of the major cities is not outside the realm of possibility. Uh, what say you? Um, I'm not sure that it's quite that bad yet, but you know, I think you had a great example when you talked about New York in the seventies. Um, mm -hmm. One of my, uh, the people I had a great fortune to train with was Pat Rogers and Pat Rogers was in that precinct in the seventies that Fort Apache, the Bronx was on. So, you know, it got to the point that you would be rolling, you know, you'd roll. If I remember the story correctly. You'd, you'd be riding with your windows down. They'd fire a few shots at you. You'd, you know, crack a few back at them and you'd keep going. So, I mean, is that, is that a uh, level of low level conflict? Yeah, I think probably so. But, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to see, you know, ever since Ferguson happened, uh, the ambush style murders of law enforcement officers have definitely been going up. When you look at the incident at Baton Rouge or Dallas or stuff like that. So again, um, if you're going to deliberately target the police and, you know, I think one of the, one of the things that's just absolutely baffled me is in some of these civil unrest situations, not aware, not allowing the officers to wear riot gear. I'm like that. I can't help but think that's an OSHA complaint waiting to happen. I mean, that riot gear is personal protective equipment to protect you from the things that you're known that are going to be thrown. And if you're not wearing, if your command structure is not letting you wear that stuff, um, I think that's uh, criminally negligent as far as that goes. Um, I think that what's going to happen is again, you're going to have areas that tolerate this stuff and areas that don't. Um, I think what's going to, we're going to continue to see until somebody, you know, until we get to, to appreciate the situation is I think that every time there is a controversial police shoot, and that means pretty much any police shooting at this point, uh, you're going to have some form of unrest associated with that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure there's been a lot of hellabaloo about uh, that recent, there's a great video out of Phoenix where the, um, Officer makes a hostage rescue shot. Maybe if you have the video and you show that the guy was shooting at everybody as he was going down the street before the officers arrived and was holding his kids hostage. But short of that kind of an aggravating circumstance, I think that every time there's a controversial shooting, you're going to have some form of civil unrest if the area allows it. And that seems to have been the trend overall. A lot of these things are happening because authorities are allowing it to happen. I mean, the, the famous or the infamous quote out of Baltimore about, you know, giving them space to event or whatever the exact phrase was. And that was either the mayor or the chief of police that said that. So, you know, you tend to get a lot of what you tolerate. So we'll, we'll see what we're willing to continue to tolerate. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah. And one of the things I, I I'm going to make a remark, you know, like I, if, for those that don't know what LARPing is live action role playing, it's where adults, you know, run through the woods and, and, and stuff like that. I've mentioned this last week on coffee with the rich, and I think it's important one of the things that leads me to think we won't see the level of violence that we could or would have seen many years ago, um, uh, like uh, Northern Ireland, for example, or some sort of sectarian problem like they have around the world and other places is we just, we just don't see the level of death and, and stuff like that. When you have Antifa clashing with groups like the proud boys, 
more often than not, it, it looks like, and I hate to be disrespectful, LARPing. And I think we're LARPing our way into something because it will only take a few more Kyle Rittenhouse type events uh, to lead to some real violence uh, like we saw in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah, and I think that's not even LARPing. It's almost like a virtue signaling kind of a surprise. You know, we're, we're seeing a lot more virtue signaling. You know, I'm a, I'm a good, decent person because I'm out here um, protesting this three-time felon that got burned down by the police. I mean, it's that those are the values we seem to be instilling in people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point. Like I, I'm making my voice heard. And I think the pandemic had something to do with people having time to, to actually go out and do these things. Brett says the management mentality gets frontline cops killed. Of course, Brett was a California law enforcement officer, just like DC Lieutenant who said no lethal force was allowed just prior to that takeover at the Capitol building. What are your thoughts on that takeover, John, if you have any? Uh, I don't honestly know enough to form an opinion. You know, one of the things that uh, if you've been around this long enough is that you have to wait months to actually get the information out there. There have been several controversial police actions that when you just look at, you know, the, the cell, you know, 10 seconds of cell phone clip look horrible. But in hindsight, what was going on was was legitimate. It was the best they could do. So I'm withholding judgment on that whole capital situation until all the information is in. Um, I just don't think we know enough at this time. And uh, there's enough spec baseless speculation going on that I really don't want to contribute to that. Yeah, that's great because uh, you could say the same thing for like going all the way back to the Rodney King uh, incident. What was it uh, March of 1991? And KLTA gets, gets the video from Mr. Holiday and they edit out 10 seconds that provides 10 seconds worth of really good context to what you're going to see as far as a use of force incident. And, uh, and when you do that, you know, when you look at it for just that snapshot, you lose the ability to understand everything that was going on. And it just looks awful. Well, yeah, all the, all police use of force decisions take place in a larger context. And what the media is great at is removing any of that context and only showing you the actual moment force was used, not necessarily the, you know, the, the, the 30 seconds or the 30 minutes that led up to that use of force. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, I'm addicted to context. I, I think context is important. And also, like you said, we don't know what we don't know at this time. Yeah, I can look at some cell phone footage of them uh, climbing the Capitol walls or somebody uh, tasing an old woman and go, oh my God, this is horrible. But let's wait till the smoke clears. Let's all smoke a cigarette and relax and, and wait until the investigation is done. I used to have, you know, a uh, folks that I worked for as an investigator. What do you think, Rich? What do you see? And I'm like, Hey man, I, I'm not there yet. I'm still gathering evidence. I, the only way to keep myself objective is to just, is to not leap to those conclusions. Yeah. So let's wait till we have all the facts, which is hard. And in, in, in an information age, wouldn't you say, John, for people to, to like, I want instant information. Now I want the answer now. Well, and, and the problem is again, we're not giving people background. I cannot think of any use of force by the police, no matter how legitimate that looks good. We are such a, because nobody understands violence in this country anymore, we're incredibly violent averse. So something as simple as, you know, a leg sweep takedown and stuff like that. I don't, you know, maybe that was way below the required level of force necessary. If all we focus on is that, is that, that moment that the force was used, the actual act, we don't have proper perspective. You know, there's a lot of stuff that led up to that decision. Um, you know, there's stuff that you can't see from a distance. There may be stuff that you can't even pick up on a body camera, you know, smells and stuff like that. So it really is important to get the full information before you start making decisions. Yeah. TC says, uh, just like in combat, initial reports are always inaccurate. Well said, uh, John, that, that is all I had for you this morning. I've, I really appreciate your time. We've been on here for an hour and 40 minutes and it's been an amazing show. I have to get you on here again, if you have time. John, where can folks find you at? Uh, so two, two spots, uh, rangemaster.com. I'm there under the staff. Uh, I'll, I'll talk and you know, have a link to the new website I just put up. And again, the, the other website is jhern.com. Again, I apologize. That's not up to date. I do have some classes rolling out. Uh, besides the lecture stuff, uh, besides stuff like on the crime, I also do teach firearms. Uh, I have a really big block on human performance under stress. Uh, if the bill that you mentioned earlier is what I'm thinking of, that's Mead Hall Range out in Oklahoma. I'm out there for uh, three days in April. 
So Meat Hall Range on Facebook, if you want to check me, uh, some of those class listings are there. And again, jhearn.com will be, eventually be the portal to all things John Hearn. Uh, we're just trying to get it there right now. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And if you want to train with Mike Seeklander and I, please check out Shooting Dash Performance for the 2021 calendar is up. I'll actually be in Phoenix, uh, training in the Phoenix PD in March. Mike and I will be, so that'll be interesting. Hopefully I can meet that brave, brave officer that uh, did the hostage rescue recently. It was amazing. But everybody uh, out there, John, anything else for our guests this morning? The only thing I'll say is if you're in Phoenix, make fun of Cecil for me. I'll just give me that. <laughs> yeah, Cecil's my boy. I, you you know I'm going to do that. And then uh, hopefully I'll get some mat time with him and he can beat the crap out of me. But Yeah, yeah, I know he owes me a lot. You know, and one day that debt is going to be paid and it will not be good for me. <laughs> no, no, it won't. Uh, yeah, so he's talking about Cecil Birch with Immediate Action Combatives, part of the Shiv Works Collective. He's been on Coffee with the Rich before. Cecil's a good dude. Yeah, uh, uh, Kathleen says, thank you, fellas. Very good topic. Excellent interview and program. I always learn so much. Plus, it's great to hang out with like-minded folks. Gerald says, great show. Thank you. Elke says, great show, gents. Uh, thank you, folks. And remember, the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>